Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the subcommittee, I bring to you today um, HR 732, it's LC 432271S. Um, what this seeks to do, and it, it has to be a constitutional amendment, uh, right now when local governments, uh, subdivisions of the state, issue uh, what, what we refer to as tax anticipation notes, that is, for some reason, um, uh, the revenue is coming in slow because the tax bills went out late, that, that sort of thing. So they, they know the revenue is coming in, but they need bridge funding to do that. Uh, the Constitution requires those to be paid back on or before December 31st of the calendar year. In, in my county of Fulton and some other counties uh, around the state, sometimes the tax bills go out in late October into early November. The, the taxes aren't due to be paid back till late December or, or maybe even Jan January. So you have these tax anticipation notes if, if they're needed get borrowed, but then they're required to pay them back before the end of the year. It doesn't really provide the type of funding. So what this uh, amendment to the Constitution would seek to do is allow the political subdivisions to have those tax anticipation notes, but pay them back within a 12-month period. It doesn't do anything. There's a limit on the, the amount of money that can be uh, borrowed. Uh, it changes nothing about that. It simply gives them the opportunity to actually make use of this vehicle um, to uh, use bridge funding while they're waiting on the tax bills to be paid. Mr. Chairman, the, the operative language is on uh, lines 18 and 19 uh, and 22 and 23. It just simply says to be paid in full within 12 months of the initial funding date of such loan and instead of such calendar year, it says over the immediately following 12 months. So we're not trying to give anybody the opportunity to go further into debt. We're not letting them uh, keep it uh, longer than, than they need to, just giving them the opportunity to use it. I think you may have some speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don't have any questions. I appreciate your presentation. These hearings today are for uh, just hearings only. There won't be any votes taken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ch Chairman Hogan, um, you have a bill, 1301. There's nobody. No man. Thank you, Mr. Sub uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have uh, substitute House Bill 1301, LC 510125S. This bill. Uh, is for the working man out there and women who do lawn, lawn care work and it uh, does away with discrimination of gas powered engines, lawn mowers, leaf blowers uh, and such. So uh, there's some movement in some of the states in the nation to do away with gas engines. So this protects the gas engines for these workers out there who are doing lawn care and it's amazing the number of trailers that these lawn carriers pull behind their trucks and they're loaded with gas equipment. So this uh, protects the discrimination uh, for gas engines. So that's basically what the bill does. Okay. Thank you. Any members have any questions? We I think we have some speakers signed up too. We do. We, do. we have some uh, Mary Kay Mr. Woodworth, if you would come forward. And Kathleen Bowen right after her, and Brian Tolar after her. Thank Good afternoon, you. Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> to be here to speak to you in support of House Bill 1301. My name is Mary Kay Woodworth, and I'm the Executive Director of the Georgia Urban Agriculture Council. We are a trade association uh, that represents the landscape, turf, and horticulture industry. Our ag industry which includes the urban agriculture green industry um, is, excuse me, in terms of total economic employment, we're the 10th largest ranked state in the, in the nation. Okay. And in the state, we've got $10 billion in annual sales and over 100,000 100, employees. Our green industry businesses are owned and operated by a diverse population, women, men, African-American, Latino, white, and Asian citizens of Georgia. And over 90% of these Georgia businesses have 10 employees or less. 
As an industry, we fully support the transition from gas power to electric leaf blowers, but at present, the technology is not viable for most commercial use. We're concerned with what has happened in other states and is now being considered by individual jurisdictions to ban the use of gas-powered <coughs> leaf blowers. The impact of these bans would affect our members as the difficulty of operating their businesses across jurisdictions will create chaos and confusion for their businesses and their employees. The cost of doing business will increase as they would be forced to purchase new equipment that, is, that at present is significantly more expensive to acquire with current battery technology that is less efficient. This in turn could lead to job losses as these businesses adjust to greater costs of operating their businesses. We appreciate your consideration of House Bill 1301. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Let's see, we have Representative Shannon on Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This question is actually for the bill sponsor. I was trying to get in there before you went to public comment. So um, do I need to wait until the bill sponsor is back up before us or how would you like me to proceed? Yeah, go ahead and ask the bill sponsor. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, just wanted to know what city or county is currently considering outlawing gas leaf blowers or gas equipment for landscaping? I, I don't, I'm not aware of any in the state of Georgia, and I, this is just a, a bill to head that off because it is happening in some other states around the nation and other cities and counties. So I think this would be damaging to the state of Georgia and to a lot of hardworking people out there who are working hard to make a living. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. <clears throat> okay. Ms. Bowen, <clears throat> thank you. Hello, Kathleen Bowen here on behalf of ACCG. ACCG, as this committee fully knows, we typically oppose any kind of preemption bill, and this bill is a preemption bill because it, prohibit, it prohibits local governments from regulating gasoline-powered leaf blowers. We do appreciate the author of the bill for bringing this sub because as um, we did a research to see which, what type of ordinances counties have regarding leaf blowers or any kind of other landscape type of equipment, and most of them are regulating the hours of operation and the use of a muffler. Habersham County is one of them. So th with the sub today, that you would still be able to have those regulations in place. So we do appreciate, as I said, the author listening to our concerns. The only caveat there is that with, if this bill were to, to pass, you'd have to treat all um, leaf blowers the same. You couldn't differentiate between a gasoline one and an electric one. So I'll pause there. Are there any questions? Anyone have any questions? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tolar. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm Brian Tolar, represent uh, Tolar Capital Partners. And in my job, I get a chance to work with a lot of great folks in the nursery and landscape and also the turf grass sector. And uh, I enjoy it very much. They. Uh, they produce a product that a lot of us benefit from and landscapers that install it. And this is an important piece of equipment, not only for the landscape industry as was commented by Chairman Hogan, but also folks just like us. I mean, I would probably argue that everyone in this room has a gas powered leaf blower or they've had one in the past. It's a common tool. And for as to my point on the, on the agriculture side of it, as you know, the agriculture industry, and this is an agriculture issue, when you get to the landscape sector, that is an agriculture sector. As Ms. Woodworth commented, it's a $10 billion industry. But agriculture can't operate city to city, county to county. There has to be consistency throughout. And we've seen this in the history of this state. We have state preemption on fertilizer. We have it on pesticides. We have it on outdoor water use. And we also have it on the types of crops that we grow. We have preemption on all those things, and so this is just asking that we keep a tool in place, we keep it consistent across the state so that gas power leaf blowers can continue to be used, not only by these industries we've discussed, but also by folks, as the chairman said, hardworking men and women that are out there that are just doing their job. And we appreciate your time on this particular issue, and we believe it is very important for Georgia 
We have 19 states that already have a city or county plus Washington, D.C. that have some prohibition on this. And the question was asked earlier about Georgia cities. We don't have any with a, pro with a, with, with a prohibition at this time, but we know that the city of Athens and the city of Decatur are exploring it. So this is an issue that's come to not only to Georgia, but also to the southeast. And we uh, would appreciate your favorable consideration to protect these tools at the proper time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? No questions. Thank you. All right, next we'll move to House Resolution 666. <coughs> Representative Benton. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Bring to you today House Resolution 666. Uh, this proposes an amendment to the Constitution so that the General Assembly uh, can authorize local boards of education to impose, levy, and collect de development impact fees and to use the proceeds to pay for a share of the cost of additional educational facilities. Now, this all it is is just a constitutional amendment for uh, to, to, to set up the, the work so that the General Assembly can come back and, and or a government agency can come back and, and do and tell us what they will be able to collect those fees on. We've had these around since about 1990 uh, for other areas, uh, municipalities, counties, water and sewer, uh, and they are used to pay for uh, pub uh, public services and uh, facilities. Uh, they're a one-time fee that's charged to either land development developers or to the homeowners uh, to help defray the cost of expanding capital facilities to serve new growth. Uh, when you look at school systems in most of our counties, they are the largest taxer. Uh, they, they are the ones that um, are responsible for educating your children, getting them to and from school, and a lot of times the tax dollars that they are able to raise are not enough, especially if they are in a fast growth system. Uh, my home county of Jackson is one of those. Uh, we, have, we have just built a brand new high school. It's in its first year of operation. We're already pulling mobile units uh, to that facility, uh, and eventually that, that will be added on to. Now, some of that money will come from the state, but a lot of that will be local dollars. Uh, local dollars will have to pay for the infrastructure, the roads, uh, uh, water and sewage, and we're already looking at a new middle school, a new elementary school. Uh, all of those things will have to be uh, funded, and it's all brought about because of, of the development, housing development in the county. And so I'm asking that the committee uh, approve this where it can move on uh, and uh, let's add this to the Constitution that school boards can collect a impact fee. That's, I'll be glad to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Do we have, let's see, we have a question, uh, Chairman Collins. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Currently, if an impact fee is collected, it has to be done by the governing authority, the county or the city, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes. And the city can, cr can collect an impact fee and give that to the, the county school system or the city school system, is that right? They're, they're prohibited from doing that? Mm -mm. Okay. I think it's a great, great bill. I, 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 I live in a community that's grown tremendously over the last decade. Uh, growth does not pay for itself. I know developers and builders are gonna gripe and bitch about it, but I think it's probably the right thing to do for, for a lot of communities like we live in, Representative okay. Benton. Appreciate your comment, sir. Anyone else? No other questions. Well, no other questions, but we've got um, Mr. Warlick. <coughs> and then Stanley, Hayden, Stanley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ken Warlick on behalf of the Home Builder Association of Georgia. Um, I'm one of those developers that's going to gripe and bitch. Um, really, I wanted to talk about two main points today. Um, homeowners, constituents, pay too many fees already. So affordability, that's all that everyone ever talks about, but all that anyone ever does 
is create an environment that affordability isn't attainable. Impact fees. You got permit fees, tree fees, sidewalk fees, site development fees, or just simply calling it an impact fee. Those are handed down from the developer, the builder, to the end user, which is the homeowner. So in, uh, in, in Greater Atlanta, there's, there's nine counties, 67 different municipalities. The average building permit slash impact fee is over $12,000. How is that affordable? So housing affordability is affected by four factors. We call them the four L's. It's land, labor, lumber, and laws. So Congress, the General Assembly, and our local governments, they can't do anything about the price of land, labor, or materials, which we know currently are skyrocketing. But we can be intentional with our laws. We have to recognize that the housing affordability is directly impacted by new fees imposed by government, in this case, the possibility of the school boards. It's adding yet another layer, tax, if you will, to the already overinflated cost of construction. So impact fees have seven approved uses in Georgia, libraries, recreation, water supply, roads and bridges, public safety, police jails, fires, EMS, wastewater treatment, stormwater management. The local government must address the following requirements before implementing impact fees. Amend its comprehensive plan to add capital improvements, map service areas for type of facility or service which impact fees will be charged, existing and proposed levels of service for each service area, a projection of facility needs based on levels of service and growth projection in the comprehensive plan, a five-year schedule needed to facility improvements, policy statements regarding any proposed exemption and impact fees, once completed, a capital improvements elements must be reviewed and approved by the Georgia Department of Community Affairs and adopt an impact fee ordinance that spells out the actual fee schedule. This bill ignores the existing professional structure that was drafted for the very foundation of democracy. So in addition to the impact fees, local governments may charge connection fees for water and sewer, independent of the impact fees. That's just additional money. Local governments may require site-specific uh, uh, exactions and de uh, de dedications from developers on individual development projects. We see it all the time. Additionally, local governments are allowed to form private agreements with developers for construction of Im improvements and dedication of lands or services made in lieu of paying impact fees. Yet again, more money on top of that. And again, this all goes down, it's handed down to the end user, which is the homeowner, the citizens, our constituents. So money for the betterment of the schools is always appropriate, but this bill is not appropriate. And bypassing the professional structure that's already set in place is an error. School boards can collect taxes through the county tax assessor, through property taxes, and through East Plots. So I would argue that any capital needs, uh, uh, any capital needs a growing local government has can be met through established structure for the development impact fees. If a county has unmet financial needs, and has not adopted an impact fee ordinance, then my suggestion would be to use the statutes currently in place to adopt reasonable impact fees to their comprehensive plan and be able to shift some of the other eligible revenue streams to adjust to the needs for the growing school system may have. This bill would allow school boards to charge impact fees. What board is next? Where does it stop? At the end of the day, an impact fee is a tax by another name. Please don't raise our taxes. Thank you for your time. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Mr. Stanley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chair Lady Taylor, and Representative Benton. You know, um, this is the first time that I've stood and ex expressed concerns with a piece of your legislation, so. Uh, Sorry to be up here doing it, but uh, that I am. I represent the Georgia Apartment Association. Um, the Apartment Association and the apartment industry were part of the very deliberate exercise and work that went into the creation of Georgia's Development Impact Fee Law Act. It was 30 years ago. And 30 years is a long time. There haven't been any major changes over that period. And so it's entirely reasonable that ideas like this uh, be considered, and, and we don't oppose that discussion. But it is, as the previous speaker indicated, there are a lot, there's a lot that is involved with Georgia's development impact fee law. 
and uh, the decisions to identify and limit to those seven categories for impact fees was intentional. Um, Representative Benton, you were sworn in, I believe, in January of 2005, and the notes that I'm referring to today come from a, an, ad an address uh, to a legislative committee in the House August of that year. So the issues are still here, and they're gonna continue to be. Uh, we, the Apartment Association, does not believe that school boards are properly built to, to administer impact fees on development. Um, however, if you're going to move forward, if the legislature wants to move forward with using impact fees for education, um, there should be a great deal that goes into it, um, certainly more than, than a page and a half with a question on the Constitution. Um, here, are some, here are some of the comments I'd like to share. There should not be any parallel impact fee law solely for schools. As was stated earlier, the Development Impact Fee Act has proved itself workable, and it's importantly, it's predictable law when properly implemented at the local level. The calculation and collection of school impact fees should remain with the counties, or in rare cases, with the cities. The power shouldn't be given to the school board. Perhaps there is an intergovernment coordination or memorandum that could be reached between the, the counties and cities in a, in a local school system if it were to go that way. School boards should, and I believe they do, have to prepare a long-range capital expenditure plan, as is the case with the Development Impact Fee Act for counties and, and municipalities, and make them accountable to the county for all expenditures. Impact fees for schools should only be imposed and expended for new school facilities. They should not be used to remedy past problems or planning that, that didn't hold up. And so if you do get into adding education to the list of, of categories that impact fees could be charged for, as the current law provides, there needs to be an equitable approach to it. And so just even looking at multifamily apartment properties, uh, you know, what rates would be applied to multifamily and single family detached residential, given that census numbers clearly indicate that owners of single family detached res residential are significantly more likely to have school aged children than apartment renters. What distinctions will be made between the types of rental communities? Um, garden style properties in apartments typically have the highest percentage of school aged children on average and high rise communities have the lowest. That's similar in the case of rent, rent level. The higher the rent level, typically there are fewer school aged children. Do affordable rental communities pay? impact fees? Are they waived? Who, who makes up that infrastructure impact? Would age-restricted adult communities be required to pay impact fees because they would uh, have li limited impact on the schools? Student housing be? And, and without going on and on, which I understand I've already done a little bit, um, there's a lot that goes into this. And there was a several years approach to the development of the impact fee law three decades ago. And if this is something that the legislature sees as uh, a time to revisit, then we would encourage it to be done in a, uh, a slow, methodical approach. You know, one final, one final thought on that. Should communities, counties that exempt property taxes for seniors be allowed to charge impact fees to developers. Development and developers don't create the need, they respond to a need. Apartment developers, commercial office developers, stores, home builders, they answer a need. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, as you consider this, I would hope uh, that 
you uh, do it carefully and understand that there are many, many moving parts to this type of law. Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, yes, sir. <clears throat> you know, I, I realize that uh, they uh, that my the two gentlemen that came up here a while ago and, and spoke against the bill, they're missing the point. The bill just calls for an amendment to be voted on by the people of the state of Georgia, yes or no, would schools be allowed to impose an impact fee? It will then be up to the legislature to draw up the rules and regs for this. I know that we already have a, a law on the books that was established in 1990 that sets up all the rules. We're not trying to exempt schools from those rules. We're trying to have a mechanism where growth far out seed exceeds any planning to give school systems the opportunity to either recruit, recoup the money or have the money ahead of time to provide these services. Um, it, it, is, it is not, we are not in this bill trying to ignore what's already on the books. It simply says, we add school systems to the Constitution of the state of Georgia. Yes or no? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. We'll go back to Chairman Martin's bill, which was um, 732. I think, did y'all want to speak to that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. If you'd state your name and who you represent. Yes, it's oh, on. Is it on? Yes, yes, sir. I'm Marvin DeReef, the Chief Financial Officer of Fulton County Schools, and I'm here to uh, express our support in the bill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee, for this opportunity to speak. Um, it is my pleasure to really talk about an important bill for us and probably other counties and school districts. Um, regarding this tax anticipation note bill. It has, for us, a TAN is a contingency plan. It is it's good to have when you need it and you hope that you never need to use it. Um, when you experience cash flow issues uh, during the school year for whatever reason, as Representative Martin expressed, usually delay in tax bills. As for Fulton County Schools, the majority of our uh, our revenue come from property taxes. Um, so this bill is very important to us because we've had situations um, where we had to make decisions because our tax bills were late, but that December 31st date uh, posed an obstacle for us because if the tax bill due date is January 15th, it's hard to get a short-term loan when they know that the bills aren't due until after that statutory December 31st. So it has been a problem for us in the past, and we just want to express um, our support, Fulton County School District support for the bill, and hope that others support it as well. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? No questions. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>